I'd like to introduce Anne, uh, Anne Tanner, who is our uh, Sidmouth Museum curator. Uh, she actually started as curator last year, which was a very difficult time to start because the museum couldn't open, although uh, the museum was extremely active, even though it wasn't open to the public. Um, Anne's background is in business uh, in Essex, uh, but she has done, uh, before she came here, a lot of volunteering work. She was chair of a Essex Skills Challenge Awards, and she was also in Essex a regional judge of National Training Awards. Uh, she became a member of a government committee uh, with a remit to widening participation in further education, which was chaired, I think, by Baroness Kennedy. I don't know if she was a Baroness mm. then, Anne, but, no, no. Uh, but subsequently Baroness. And um, like many of us who have become involved with the museum, um, she didn't have any museum experience, I don't think, before she came here. <laughs> no, no. And uh, uh, because of the uh, COVID pandemic, of course, this has been a terrific challenge to all museums in the country and um, both small and large museums. And we look forward very much to hearing uh, Anne's view on looking forward to the new normal. Thank okay. you very much, Anne. Thank you, Nigel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, at Sidmouth Museum, uh, we are looking forward to the new normal, but perhaps like these ladies walking down uh, Fourth Street to the BE Day celebration on the Esplanade, we don't actually know how our new normal will be. I attended many workshops, Zoom workshops through 2020. And we, I, I believe that um, Southwest Museums threw everything at us to know how to operate a new normal, whatever size we were. So new normal, they told us, means you must be prepared to adapt and develop to reopen safely. Uh, when the, our stewards had their training in uh, 2020, uh, we didn't um, have the new extension quite complete. And uh, so now we have um, a safe disabled access at the rear of the museum. Our volunteers will be able to move the open signs outside safely with a trolley. And the volunteers will also enjoy a new kitchen and cloakroom. Uh, the new normal required us to rethink the museum layout before we opened. Uh, I'm sure that even after the 21st of June, uh, people will still require personal space. So we, were, um, we needed to streamline the museum wherever possible. Uh, we are in the process of establishing a one-way system on the first floor, which is, is a natural system. Uh, so that's been quite easy. Uh, all the time at the workshops, they said, be flexible, look for alternatives, and we're still finding things that we need to tweak a little. One of the um, examples of uh, alternatives has been um, moving from hands-on to hands-free information providers. Now, for the last two years, we have wanted to do more with the ground floor displays, uh, for our disabled visitors to give them a better experience. And we've managed this now. We are in the process of creating a large new Jurassic Coast geology section with a greater focus on the Sidmouth coastline. We've doubled the amount of exhibits and we have a large new uh, information boards concentrating on Sidmouth's part of the Jurassic Coast. Uh, we have part of um, our move from hands on to hands free has been the new interactive digital displays, which are all on the ground floor and so easily accessible to all. Lockdown came, gave us time to consider some short term objectives that we could achieve uh, with our collections. We are cons conscious that we need to provide a way for the community and the general public to access our archives, which have been largely inaccessible and unseen. 
We do have a new scheme to increase our collections in the future. I'm talking 10, 20 years time. If anybody's got an object that they would like to donate to Sidmouth Museum sometime way in the future, to make sure it comes to us, they can actually um, donate it now, complete the paperwork, and then take a loan back immediately so that the object is in your home until you really decide you're moving, you've had enough, and you want to give it to the museum. So it, if um, you're interested in that, please um, uh, contact us uh, on the um, SBA website. For the visitors, it's still all about developing new ways to connect with the visitors while they're in the museum. And for our volunteers, we realized we needed to upgrade the systems we had to make their work much easier, particularly with the shop. So grants, um, we were offered a lot of grants to prepare for the new normal. Some of them we couldn't go for. Um, they, were, they started at too high an amount, believe it or not. Uh, successful grant applications are really the only way that museums of our size can um, access funds for innovation. Uh, they're very competitive. There are almost more applications than the funds available. The guidance for 2020 grants across the board indicated that digital activities were considered a priority. We were considering two projects to meet our short term objectives, both using digitization, the new way to connect with our audience and also to make the volunteers work easier. During the planning stage, we identified a problem. There were too many Wi-Fi dead zones in the museum, so the problem was included in our solution, which was uh, part of the funding application. In August 2020, we applied to Southwest Museums for a recovery grant uh, for all the costs of the equipment we needed for the projects. And luckily, our grant was successful. So what did we do? Well, I'm sure for those of you that come to the museum, you will re remember the old 1970s photo box. So we decided that this had to go because it was hands-on. The old photo box panels illustrating the history of Sidmouth were, as the uh, photo panels on the left, um, A2 size. They were very popular with our visitors, but the only way you could view the panels was by lifting them out of the wooden box one by one. So we aim to radically upgrade and expand the photo box concept to offer a greater flexibility with the digitized panels to deliver a unique experience uh, with two interactive 43 inch display units showing 23 topics with over 250 slides. Before I move to the next slide, I would like to thank Nigel uh, and um, Gary Cross we, we have worked as a team all through the winter for six months. We had to deliver this project by the end of January to claim down the rest of the grant, and we managed it. So this is the um, topic, uh, the topic screen that you would see, uh, which is a bit like choosing a, a Netflix film. Uh, so I'm going to show you two lots of slides. The first one is first lot of slides of the history of the Sidmouth Seafront. You'll see that because it's digital, we can use um, images of the prints that we have in the museum, as well as the photographs. So Sidmouth um, has changed considerably from the 1796 view, um, and this, this slide takes you through um, to see Peak House that was up on the hill. Um, this is one that Deborah used uh, by Noble in um, her talk the last time. And to look at uh, the Chit Rock, which um, on the 22nd of November was destroyed together with all the cottages on the beach. 
The Esplanade. Um, the first Esplanade uh, was um, just banked up and uh, wasn't very stable. The, um, it continually got washed away and um, the violent storm of 1824 really caused such a problem. Uh, they thought that they must do something about it. Um, and John Wallace at this time um, decided to have his new building enlarged and which eventually became the Bedford Hotel. The first sea war was 1835. Um, it cost 2,150. Uh, the Lord of the Manor partly subscribed to it. Uh, it totally changed the appearance of the seafront. Perhaps wasn't so good for the fishermen. Uh, they had to pull their uh, boats up onto the esplanade with ladders. And the curved um, wall at the western end is, uh, was being ready for uh, the harbour, which didn't happen. Mid to late 19th century, uh, Sidmouth had become a desirable um, seaside resort. And they were looking forward to the railway coming. And in 1972, the trustees funded a successful bid. And 6th of July, 1874, the railway arrived and the town celebrated for four days. And the Esplanade to 1900 to World War I, the, the manor uh, built the Prime Baths, they built the Victoria Hotel, uh, both designed by Sampson. Um, the, uh, when the Victoria Hotel opened, the invited guests from London were doctors and a special train brought them down from Waterloo. The Esplanade in World War I, it's a lovely picture outside um, Beach House of the first volunteers posing for their photograph before they went off to their camp. Peak House um, was the largest BAD hospital in Devon and families used to visit their injured, injured relatives and walk along the seafront. And the Brian Baths um, gave free treatment to the convalescent officers. The storm damage of 1904 and 1925 was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Um, late 24 uh, was November and December, and then January 25 um, only made what had already been done much, much worse. Um, there was a hole that was big enough to swallow up a hundred cars. More holes opened up until most of the Esplanade was wrecked. Uh, work started in February 1925 and the road was closed for months and months. Men could only work um, when the tide was low, often at night. There was a, a very large arch built specially at the bottom end of Station Road for the Minister of Transport to open the Esplanade, which he did in March 1926, but in fact it wasn't finished till October 1926. And Sidmouth thrived in the late 1920s and 30s. Um, little did they know that by 1939 the storm of World War II was yet to come. World War II in Sidmouth is another set of slides, so we'll go on to the last set. One of my favourites in Sidmouth is Peter Orlando Hutchinson. He truly was extraordinary. His first, um, his great grandfather was the last British governor of Massachusetts. He was offered a baronetcy by George III three times and refused three times, uh, and POH always regretted that he didn't have his aristocratic position he should have been entitled to. He was, he, he was amazing. He recorded local in incidents in his diary and often accompanied by sketches. And he, he had a sense of humor that comes through in his diaries. 
he was amazing. Whatever the weather was like, he was there on the beach sketching uh, and, um, the shipwrecks. This one happened to be in the summer, uh, but he was out there often in absolutely dreadful conditions. And his, his diaries of the, and sketches of the shipwrecks um, are valuable because these incidents were not always recorded in the newspaper. Here he says, cold as I was, I managed to get a sketch, which I colored when I got home. They really are fantastic. You might think they're a bit Larry-like. They're very, very good. He was very keen on archeology. span um, he was very careful with excavations, so causing little disruption. He was often as not joined by his friend, Nicholas Heineken. He was also a geologist. He had been fascinated by geology since he was a child. You often see him with um, his stick in his right hand which was um, to help a limp caused by a childhood ailment. The, these paintings are really lovely and I would love to have them on my wall. Uh, he was an expert in the geology of Sidmouth and there are many, many sketches uh, of Sidmouth's cliffs. His record of the lime kilns and the coming of Jacob's ladder through sketches is, is amazing. It really points out cliff erosion. On, on the left, there's an 1851, which in fact the donkeys used to go up the path. And then 1871, the erosion, the path is gone. And this was a particularly terrible ladder that was soon to go because the ladies couldn't possibly climb up it. It was straight up. And then in 1888, um, the uh, ladder improved and he, he wrote, remains of the old lime kilns altered and fancifully built over being in private grounds. That was the grounds of Sea View, now Connaught Gardens. This is lovely. I live on Sulcombe Hill. And to think that I can look out of a window and see the field that uh, Hutchinson could see and that they managed to get um, the cavalry up there uh, with so many men on horses. It, it's just incredible. He uh, loved the military. He also was a snob and um, he really found he'd write reached his rightful place in society when um, he attended the Marquis of Northampton soirees. And um, he must have a photographic memory. He, he must have drawn these when he got back to his lodgings um, after the evening soiree. He also, uh, on one, he was there with uh, Prince Albert. Um, absolutely incredible. The staircase is, is wonderful. And uh, this is the view, uh, views from Forco Bird Terrace. These were drawn in 1848. They're absolutely lovely. You, you could put them on your wall today. I think they're great. Peter Orlando Hutchinson built the old chancel after the extensive improvements of the church. He decided to build the original chancel on his land next to Fall Coburg Terrace. And he started in 1859 and moved in in 1866. And I, I, he, he had to be frugal, I think, because it was eating up money, this building. Um, he, had, he lived alone with uh, a servant. He had two in, in his time there, Mrs. Weber, who died in 1867, and Ian Carslick Newton, who received a pension from him after he died. This is how we see POH, his legacy to Sidmouth, his handwritten di uh, diaries, 
uh, with illustrations, um, 1848 to 1894. He did destroy the earlier ones. Five volumes of the history of Sidmouth, a guide to Sidmouth that ran for nine editions. Every year after he died, it was just tweaked a little. And the ninth edition, the last edition was published in 1926. He wrote the geology of Sidmouth, ferns of Sidmouth, and there are, sadly we don't have them all, an incredible 750 sketches and paintings. So our second project to help connect with our visitors, QR codes. QR codes are the things you use to uh, show that you've um, uh, visited somewhere during the COVID uh, crisis. Um, but for museums, they can really enhance a visitor's experience. They provide more detailed information about a display or artifact you see things like scan the code to know more. All the visitor needs is a smartphone with an internet, internet access. I know you're thinking for a, a lot of people, there is a problem. We do not have a smartphone. Well, we have a solution. Uh, all the QR codes will be accessible via the interactive display units on the ground floor. So I'll show you now what they look like. So the topic page, the first page you will see is um, rather like the topic page for the photo box. So we're selecting the Far Eastern Canon. Now I'm sure you've seen this Canon at various points in the museum and wondered about it. Well, with this system, you can find out so much. Um, it's we know uh, where it came from, Peter Orlando Hutchinson. It was uh, taken from pirates uh, by his, his cousin who was in charge of a boarding party off the coast of Borneo. You can find out about uh, Captain Cedric Belcher and the book, book on the zoology. It was a zoological um, expedition. Uh, the, um, POH's relative died on the way back, but the gun was still given to his uh, sister because he was responsible for bringing it on board the Samaran. Uh, then we go on to looking at some of the, uh, this, is, this is the area that they were in. And these are some of the sketches that the zoological artist did as he saw various animals. And that's the HMS Samarang that was nearly lost in the Bay of Biscay. So then on to Devon Caravettes, who I'm sure that you all know. Um, so we have three sides that will tell you all about Jack White, Pat Mitchell, and how they started, and then where they moved to, and a timeline, sadly, when the business left Sidmouth. And the last one in this section, the last Lord of Sidmouth Manor. I think that there is a lot to know about him and what he did for Sidmouth. So Hugh Balfour, um, we tell you here uh, where he came from, his parents, etc. Uh, his father died uh, very early on. Um, the children were young, and uh, so the, the property passed to the trustees. Uh, they built a new house, which we have today, and this is the house, the plans, artist's impression, and we talk about his military career. He had friends in high places. Um, the Duke of Connaught, he met regularly. Uh, we, we can see Sampson uh, with one of the tenant farmers. Uh, Major 
the um, Hugh Balfour took on two very important employees, Major Hastings and Sampson, the architect. And together, they really created the Sidmouth we know today. By the end of the 19th century, the manor owned water, gas, the railway company. It had built the new Sidmouth Baths, now the Kingswood Hotel. It had built the Victoria. Um, it uh, built the Manor Hall Pavilion, the Golf Club. Some notable buildings that belonged to the manor at some stage were Tudor Cottage, Rock Co Cottage, and Fortfield Terrace. They also owned the Fortfield in front of Fortfield Terrace. He, he was not always a popular man, and, and a lot of people have got big um, things against some, some of the things he did were not approved of at all. Uh, Colonel Balfour died in 1952, and there was a really nice piece in one of the papers. With hindsight, many of his contributions should be gratefully remembered. Now, back to our achievable short-term objectives. Oops. In our collections, we've identified that we need to provide this new way for the community and general public to access our archives. The guidance for 2021 grant still indicates that digital activities are considered a key priority. We now have the opportunity to apply for a grant to digitize our first project. And that is Tyndall's 10 volumes of shingle, which were compiled between 1922 and 1931. And we want these to be accessible to everyone via our website. The, this project, uh, it consists of 10 volume, 10 large volumes, 2,517 pages. Um, they were typed up and bound. So they are absolutely original typed documents. They contain almost daily observations of the conditions, the foreshore and the adjacent cliffs. And they have summaries and indexes. They also contain hundreds of original photographs with handwritten titles. John Tyndall was born in Scarborough in 1846. He was an accomplished musician and artist, but his career was in banking. He came from a wealthy family. He married Isabel Harris, who also came from a wealthy banking family. They had six children. Sadly, all but one predeceased him. He became a partner in her family bank, Bassett's son and Harris in 1874. In 1896, the bank amalgamated with Barclays and the Tyndall family moved to Sidmouth. Uh, he lived in several locations in Sidmouth, Eaglehurst, the Marina, Kenandi and Cot Maiden House, the latter two uh, were from the 1920s. In 1914, Tyndall joined the Sidmouth Volunteers. In 1916, he became a signaller. And he, the photograph shows you Tyndall uh, and the signallers in 1918. John Tyndall was a relatively experienced writer. Uh, between 1899 and 1902, he wrote a diary of events in Sidmouth. All three volumes are in the museum archives. In 1907, being an accomplished artist, he wrote a short book, Sketching Notes. In 1919, he wrote his memories of the Great War years. The Sidmouth Volunteers, a really valuable record of the home front. Why did he suddenly think that he would start this enormous endeavor um, and record his observations in his book, Shingles. Tyndall was like many of the early amateur scientists, a keen observer and recorder of his observations. 
he wrote at the beginning of Shingles that his urge to record came from seeing work being done on old groins. Shingle had built up and access to some of the parts of Sidmouth Beach were, was closed. He considered this need for patching up old sea defences, it really made an impression on him, such that he decided to start recording what he saw. So, Shingle. From 1922 to 1931, John Tyndall, aged 75, devoted his time. It was almost that he was almost obsessive. It was an extraordinary endeavor. Uh, almost every day he would walk down to the beach and record, as he said, careful observations of the foreshore and adjacent cliffs. What did he really concentrate on? wind direction and speed, rainfall, a list of major weather incidents through the year, flooding and gales a speciality, the height and shape of the shingle, the appearance of the beds of shingle and their movement, and, and he really tried to work out the cause of the movement. He considered every time he went down there, the mouth of the Sid, was it open or closed? Which way was the Sid flowing? He concentrated on cliff falls and cliff erosion, breaches in the seawall and damage to the esplanade. That didn't just happen at times of great storms. It was a continual problem. Uh, he concentrated on the fishing catches, uh, mainly herring and mackerel. He looked at and recorded the types of seabirds and their distribution. And he enjoyed the behavior of the swans at the mouth of the Sid. He didn't just concentrate on the Sidmouth coastline. Uh, he did look further afield and he was assisted by a network of helpers reporting into him. Uh, so he also includes records and photographs of um, Axmouth and the Seton coastlines. His daily observations would be recorded diary style with monthly summaries of all the measured conditions. He also provided half yearly and annual summaries. And these were really quite complex. I have to point out with these photographs that I have photographed the photographs that he stuck into his original manuscripts with glue, uh, they weren't always straight, and the pages won't flatten. That is why we need a company with digitizing experience of old books. The, um, just to point out that when they're digitized, you will be able to go to the website and read the book just as if you had it in front of you. The pages will flip open and um, it, it will really be easy to um, gather information from. I think this is a lovely shot on the left, uh, the wind and the rain measurement, and on the door of the uh, large building behind, it's advertising the Sulcan Regis Garden Fate. With this uh, set of, uh, with this slide, He's concentrating on the uh, winds and how the shingle is after the winds with, and the rough seas, heavy weather. These are lovely photographs, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, the tide coming in at Clifton Cottage, that's 1930. He doesn't, it's only the latter stages that he puts the year down, which sometimes is confusing. He's concerned with the height and shape of the shingle. Jacob's Ladder, 1931. It's incredible. As he says, uh, shingle depleted. It's almost gone. Uh, it comes, it, obviously, it comes in and it comes in and builds up, but it's also pulled out at some times. Uh, the west corner, he calls this well packed. And shingle is denuded beyond um, a rasher. Uh, that's the word he uses for a cliff fall. This is a, 
a lovely photograph. I think that man intends to let the sieve run by digging it out with the spade. So these are, are, what, are six of probably 200 photographs of the mouth of the Cid. And they, they did incredible things in 27 and 29 to try and change the course and stop the build up of shingle. And sometimes it's absolutely closed. But when it closes, it closes in very different ways. Tyndall's photographs of the cliffs and rockfall gives us a unique insight into the land we've lost. And in particular, um, 19, tw uh, 27, 1928, I, oh, sorry, I've gone forward. Uh, 20, 23, 29, 30, 29, they're not in the right order for some reason. I, I do not know why. So he's showing you how the Pennington point changed. And the Russia's um, near Wingate in um, 16th of August, 28, great big rocks came down. And in this one, you can see the base of the flagstaff. The flagstaff up there then went, but here you can see just the base of the flagstaff. And uh, more fall at Pennington Point, uh, 3rd of January, 30. 24, 25, the breaches in the seawall and damage to the esplanade. Um, Tyndall took possibly uh, 50 or 60 photographs at this time. Some angles you will have seen before. Um, he, he concentrates a lot on the York Steps and the damage to the York Steps. Uh, fish, the fish catchers, he, he loved to um, photograph fishermen doing what they do, but he equally liked to photograph people purchasing fish. And the behaviour of the swans at the mouth of the Sid. There's some beautiful photographs he, he's taken. I mean, these are just five. There must be 30 at least. And the Sid, the mouth of the Sid is closed there, forming a nice pool for them. On his way to and from the beach, he liked to photograph people. He photographed famous people. This is uh, John Ambrose Fleming. He photographed royalty. This is the uh, Duke of Connaught with Colonel Levitt, his equerry. And he photographed people doing work. Uh, the guardians of the tents, guardians of the tents and chairs. And then relax it, relaxing. And that's a really lovely photograph. And anything that caught his eye. These wonderful cars parked opposite the Belmont Wall, a hole in Mrs. Jemmett's wall, sea wall. That was the lady that owned Sea View at the time. This is a wonderful photograph. I, I like to think that the fishermen are all in the marine uh, hotel, uh, public house, but they have to leave their boots outside. Lovely old petrol pump there. Um, the new market hall progresses, as you can see, lovely old car again. Now, this photograph is fascinating. The, it says as above, but as above was um, a visitor sitting in this pile here, and uh, it was entitled Careless Visitor, and they're still careless. It's incredible, these deck chairs just by this rock fall. And this lovely lorry is taking the barrels of fish to up to the station to catch a train to London. 
and the land we lost. This, uh, the flagstaff was erected in 1861 uh, in um, memory, well, not in memory, thanks to um, Mr. Fish, who opened his gardens at the Knoll um, every year on a Monday. He did so for 40 years, and the tradesmen in the town erected the flagstaff um, to uh, thank him for the trade that he'd brought to the town. We have it no more. Um, it came down, it was taken down in 1927. And you can see from here that, um, that this was above the flagstaff. They were widening the path on the 18th of May. And you can see that if you imagine this fence, we no longer have, it's gone. All of that land has gone since 1927. You can see it even more there, new path. We're further than that now. This, this iron railings have come gone as well. So Sunday, February the 2nd, um, there was a massive uh, slide, log, um, rock slide. And uh, these um, falls continued through Monday until, uh, as the paper says, with the result, Pennington Point has completely disappeared and it's now possible to get an uninterrupted view along the coast to Beer. So Tyndall completed his work in 1931 and died in 1933, aged 87. For many years, these volumes have been in the museum archives and have been unread and forgotten. But we have now realized that as, as part of our um, providing access objective, their, their importance is clear and it, it really may be valuable to today, today's decision making regarding the coastline. There is a detailed account from a decade that began 100 years ago. Careful almost daily observations, uh, meticulous records and high quality photographs but most importantly, that there's data waiting to be analyzed, which is, it, it, it's just so important. Um, we are so lucky to have it. If these volumes are digitized, access would be instantly um, available to individuals and groups with many diverse interests. So it's our intention to apply for a grant from the East Devon branch of the Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Um, it, we are applying to their Communities Project Fund this, at the end of this week. I'd like to thank all the organizations that have already written letters in support of our application. And if anybody listening would like to personally write an email supporting the application, please send it to info at sidmouthmuseum.co.uk or to the SVA website, uh, web address. The quotation we would like to accept is £1,913.50 from Max Communications. This company has worked on similar projects for the Royal Scottish Academy, producing excellent results. The AOMB grant is unlikely to cover more than 60% of the costs, so we are hoping to raise £765 to cover the shortfall. We hope you will agree with us that the Tyndall's 10 volumes of shingle, and, and I haven't really done, done them justice this afternoon, are a remarkable man's legacy to Sidmouth and should be available to all. I've got one little last thing from Tyndall to show you. Tyndall took these photos in November 1931. He gave us no more information than two old guns. I want to know where they left on the fort field from the 1860s and what happened to them after 1931. And if any of you know, please, please, please get in touch. Now I'm going to say thank you very much for listening to me and leave you with the slide telling you about June's talk after the AGM.
Uh, this year is the 175th anniversary of founding the Sidvale Association. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, I hope that people... <laughs> Thank Hello? you very much. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I, there is a chat box at the bottom of the screen, and if anybody would like to Thank ask, Anne, if anybody would like to ask Anne any questions, then please do so. And we'll we'll uh, and and I'm and I'm sure we'll answer them. Well, I'm sure you can answer some of them, Nigel, as well. Well, I've got a horrible feeling about the cannons. I've got Have a horrible. Yes, I've got a horrible feeling that they were um, melted down at the time of the Second World War. Oh. Some, um, uh, I know that there was a German cannon from the First World War that was yeah. melted down, and I just have a feeling that um, our old um, uh, cannons from the Fort Field had the similar fate, and people didn't seem to mind because... Uh, it was thought that they were going to go to make Spitfires, which of course yes. uh, they didn't. So uh, Perhaps we can get a timeline for what happened after 1931 to 1939. I cannot find them on any of the Fort Field photographs. No, 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 that's sad. Um, I don't know whether uh, anybody has any questions that, that uh, Anne could answer. It's we you haven't actually mentioned Anne um, when you're opening again and um, 21st of June 21st of June yes and, uh, we hope that obviously we hope that um, everybody who's watching will will come and see what is essentially um, a completely transformed museum um, we haven't seen any photographs of the new extension inside so that would be exciting for people to see and the um the new approach to showing displays i think is quite extraordinary and it shows that out of a crisis um, um good things can come and uh, quite radical changes have been made to the museum which is really quite remarkable <laughs> 